So today's presentation is um, um, being given in the context of the uh, COVID global pandemic. And in one sense, a real sense, the world has stopped. There's unemployment, travel bans, businesses are closing. Um, we are starting to see a little bit more opening up now, which is good. Uh, but in another sense, things are still moving. The world is still uh, has not stopped. And uh, for some industries, business is going quite well. And in my opinion, intellectual property will play a, a big role in helping us get out of this mess, um, not least of which uh, will relate to vaccines, uh, treatments, and cures for the virus. So um, this uh, presentation, I think, is still relevant because of that uh, and for other reasons that I'll get into. So a quick overview of the presentation. I'll have an introduction on why I think intellectual property matters, even at a time like this, and then some basic foundational concepts that will be used for parts two and three, which are the strategies uh, respectively uh, for securing uh, IP rights, so filing applications, getting trade secret protection, and then for uh, maintaining IP rights. So once you have those already pending, uh, how, to, how to keep your priority dates and that kind of thing. So um, before we get started, we did have some poll questions. I'm not sure if we can still bring those up. We had three uh, for the audience just to get a feel for uh, where every, everybody is at with regard to IP and what kind of industries you're in. Uh, great. So here's the the first poll question. Um, so if you're watching this, if uh, if you'd like uh, to submit the poll, what level of experience do you have with patent prosecution, um, novice, basic to intermediate, or advanced? Is the first question there. I guess we'll give you a few seconds to to answer that at home. Oh, do I need to answer it too? I guess I'll answer it. Okay, great. So about half novice and then the remaining uh, half is kind of split between basic and advanced. Great. And then we had uh, another question, I believe on if you've ever filed an application or overseen the filing of one patent application. And that's uh, either provisional or non-provisional or design uh, or plant, ap plant applications, if you've done one of those. So I guess we have to wait until everybody chimes in. So it looks like, uh, again, about 40%. So nearly half have and half have not. Okay, great. And then one final question on what industry uh, description best uh, applies to your particular interest uh, with regard to patents um, or otherwise, uh, what industry you might be in. And then we have the suspense of waiting for the results. All right, 92% life science, how about that? Okay, and then the remaining high tech and nobody in the consumer space, okay, great. Uh, so today's presentation should be applicable to all of that, but that helps me out um, so I can maybe uh, speak to uh, uh, what industries uh, most of you are in, which it seems like life science and then some high tech. Uh, and then um, as far as the IP level uh, of experience, that's, that's helpful to know too. So there will be some for, I think, everybody along that spectrum, novices and intermediate and advanced as well. So I'm just going to get into part one. Oops, what kind of fast there. So part one, introduction. Um, so preliminarily, this presentation covers things that you can normally do at the patent office. Um, and what that is in contrast to are things that you can now do in light of COVID. So the patent office recognizes people are struggling and so they've created new actions. So if you are hurting because of COVID and you missed uh, an extension fee payment or something went abandoned, um, there are now new actions available at the patent office if that uh, applies to you. 
this presentation will not cover any of that. So what I'll be talking about are things that normally you can do in a, a before COVID BC era, uh, which was only a few months ago, but it seems like it was forever. So a little caveat there. And again, um, I mentioned why IP is important even at a time like this. And another aspect to that issue is that IP is generally first come, first served. So you need to be the first one in line. The US patent system is now a first to file system as of uh, uh, seven years ago or so, which puts us in line, put us in line with the rest of the world. And so uh, if you get out of line, it can be irreparable. And that's why it's important even now, if you're thinking about deferring filing or letting things go abandoned, um, there are real consequences with regard to IP. And so these strategies here hopefully will help you with getting in line. And if you're in line, staying in line while reducing the expenses uh, or at least deferring the expenses down the road when uh, revenues pick up again. So the first of a few basic foundational concepts, like I said, uh, about IP before we get into the strategy. So these are the five basic types of IP protection. The one I'll be talking primarily about um, is uh, the utility patent, which protects inventive ideas. So um, functional uh, aspects of things, stuff like software, medical devices, pharmaceuticals, biotech, and innovations, um, medical diagnostics, uh, that kind of thing. And then I'll also be talking briefly about trade secrets, which protect more than just technological inventions. They can protect a lot of different things that are of uh, commercial value that you take certain steps to keep secret, things like recipes, client lists, uh, financial data, which may not be patentable, but you can uh, sometimes protect as a trade secret. And the last three, which I will not be discussing that much, are design patents, which protect how something looks, so the ornamental features of something, uh, trademarks, which are like slogans or brands uh, or taglines, which identify the source of a good or service, and then copyright, which protects the artistic expression of an idea. So not the idea itself, but how it's actually expressed after it's been uh, fixed in some tangible medium. So a provision, so a non-provisional patent application, this slide is gonna talk about the basic process at a very high level, uh, which will be um, useful for understanding some of the strategies. So the way that an application works is you go to the patent office with your application. It's got a written description of your invention. It's got a set of figures and the patent office takes it and they examine it and they let you know, hey, this looks great. They stamp it, here's a patent. That's very rare for them to do that on their first answer. More typical is they come back with a rejection in an office action and they say, you have problems with your application, here's why. Usually it's because of some prior art. So you're either not novel and or you're um, obvious over uh, the existing technology or it's because of some formality. It's not clear, it's not adequately described, that kind of thing. And so you have this back and forth kind of a negotiation with the patent office over this issue. And so that's what this red timeline represents. You file the application over a course of about six months to three years on the normal track. Um, you, you eventually get to some disposition, either a, a patent or, or you just give up and let it go abandoned. And another concept on this slide that will be helpful to understand the strategies is the concept of priority. So priority is the date that you kind of put your flagpole in the ground and stake your claim to uh, anything that comes after that. And so the uh, reason that's important is that you need to be novel and non-obvious over anything that came before you. So the earlier that priority date is then the less prior art you need to be patentable over. And so that's why an earlier priority date is important. And then as you see here, this uh, non-provisional application can claim priority to either provisionals or other pending non-provisionals. And we'll look at what that means. A non-provisional is what most people are talking about when they talk about an application that's actually getting examined. We'll talk about provisional applications more. The next slide is, about continuation practice. And 
let's just start at the top left. It's a, it's a bit of a busy chart. So let's say you file your non-provisional application while it's pending, so the first red arrow, and before it issues, hopefully as a patent, then you can file a continuation application number one. And the first patent will then hopefully go on to issue as patent number one. It will have some claim scope represented schematically by the bullseye. And then application, a continuation application number one is another application. So it has the same drawings, the same written description, but it has different claims. And those are the numbered paragraphs at the end of the document that um, uh, define the scope of protection that you'll have for your invention. And so moving along continuation, continuation application number one as it's being examined, so the red arrow to the right of that box, uh, before it goes abandoned, let's just say in this example, you file a second continuation application. And that second, that continuation application number two can claim priority to continuation application number one, which as we just saw claims priority back to the non-provisional. So what that means, and this is uh, one of the big, uh, other big concepts to get out of this, is the priority date is the same for all the continuations if you do it right. And we'll see how we can use this to uh, help on the expense side. And then just continuing the flow chart, continuation application number two could go on to be a second issued patent and potentially have a different claim scope. A final note on this slide is that the filing of the continuations need to be done before that prior application is disposed. So while it's still pending, and before it's either abandoned or issued, uh, essentially. So again, this is just a foundational concept on so-called continuation practice, which we'll look at further in the strategies. The next slide is a, an example family tree. You don't need to study the details. That's not important. What's important is just the basic idea of you can have a family and they're all connected through these priority chains. And so your priority dates for the applications which are represented by the boxes lower in the chart could potentially go all the way back to one or more of the boxes above it. And so you can have an earlier priority date for an application that's filed much later. And you can see how you can have priority claims between provisionals and non-provisionals, US, international applications, foreign country applications or outside US applications, I should say. Um, and this can be applied if, you know, this also works in other countries. I'm talking primarily about U.S. patent law here, but um, a similar type process could be used uh, for outside countries. And so um, that's um, the, the kind of foundational concepts. One final note is a framework for thinking about patents, which um, will help uh, understand the limits and caveats of using some of these strategies. So one framework for thinking about patents is not binary, but more of on a spectrum of confidence. So not, not so much that the invention is patented or, or not, but that the patent protection falls on some uh, location of a, of a continuum of confidence. And it's very similar to um, many markets in the sense that you kind of get what you pay for. So if you pay an attorney to spend a lot of time to understand the technology, to draft it very scrupulously, to put in a lot of details, you're going to have much better protection. You're going to have a much higher quality patent. It's going to be more expensive. On the flip side, if you want to save money and have a lower budget, then you may be sacrificing uh, quality, you may be sacrificing the scope or strength of, of protection. Um, it may be adequate for what you need. Um, for example, during a global viral pandemic, maybe it's sufficient to just get some sort of bare bones protection uh, for a priority date, um, as opposed to having nothing at all. So just understand you should really consult with intellectual property counsel or somebody that's familiar with uh, these types of issues before you implement these strategies so you fully understand what the pros and cons are. So part two, on to the strategy. So this is securing IP protection. And again, this is about you don't have an application filed. Um, you haven't taken steps to protect a trade secret. How do you initiate that process and do so uh, while, re while reducing or deferring um, the expenses associated with that? So the first strategy is drafting the application uh, and having it coached. So as I said, the first step 
in getting patent protection is you prepare an application. Typically an attorney does that. And uh, one way to save money on having an attorney draft the whole thing is to have a template provided and then the inventor or inventors fill out the template and the attorney can just review it and revise it. Um, you know, it can be tailored to a budget or, or however you'd like to do it. But in theory, it should be less expensive than having an attorney uh, spend all of that time um, and expense in, in fully drafting it. Now, again, you're not gonna get the benefit of the experience uh, of an attorney, you know, who understands what details to include, how to say it, what phrases to avoid, and that kind of thing. Um, but you know, it may be a suitable compromise, uh, as I stated. And then on the right is just a, a sample template um, that I've used before, typically with you know solo inventors or startups on a low budget. And um, you know, this can be a, a very good way of of uh, uh, keeping expense down, but yet still getting something uh, of value um, that's that's beyond just filing a, a sketch or a PowerPoint presentation for your application. Strategy number two relates to provisional applications. So as I said, non-provisional applications are the ones that the examiner eventually picks up and examines. Provisionals are not examined. They're basically placeholders for up to one year. I think the idea behind them was to give you time to um, research the market, investors, that kind of thing, to see if there's any interest in your invention before you go forward with the more expensive non-provisional and one of the advantages is that the filing fee is less expensive, currently about $280 with the US Patent Filing Office, uh, Patent and Trademark Office. Now that's just a filing fee. There will then, if you hire an attorney to do it, be attorney's fees to uh, draft it as well, but that's just a filing fee compared to the non-provisional, which is either 1,000 or 2,000, depending on how big your company is. The other advantage is that you can uh, file a very informal document. It can be a hand sketch PowerPoint slides, uh, something of that nature. Uh, and again, the understanding there that the risk is if you just file a sketch, you're only going to get credit for the details that, that are included. And what I mean by credit is your priority date. You're only going to get credit for your priority date for those details. And so if you only included details A and B, but not C, then you're only going to get credit for A and B at that time and um, not for, for aspect C. So provisional applications, you know, if you file one now, it can buy you some time, maybe in a year, you have uh, more budget uh, to convert it to a non-provisional. Or uh, what you can do on the next slide is um, you can see, um, break the provisional out into multiple non-provisionals. So the left side of the slide shows what I was just talking about, where let's say you file a provisional now in 2020, and then next year in 2021, perhaps when budgets increase, then you file your non-provisional. Or what you could do is file multiple non-provisionals that can all claim priority back to the same provisional. And that can be a way of really deferring those higher expenses associated with filing three non-provisional applications by putting them all into one uh, single provisional. Ideally, the subject matter um, would be related. However, you couldn't just throw three different disparate inventions, generally speaking, into the same application. And another point with provisionals that you can use with this strategy is within that one year time frame that you have, you can file multiple provisional applications. So you might file one now in May of 2020, and then in December of 2020, you file a second one that adds on maybe further details, maybe further test results, maybe you've developed your drug further, maybe you know which compounds are working, which aren't, and that kind of thing. Uh, and then in March 2021, in this example, let's say you file a third one, and then at that one year anniversary from the earliest filed provisional, then you can roll up all three of those into a single non-provisional application. And the way that would work is you would, you would get credit for priority purposes uh, for the date of the provisional filing in which those particular details were provided. So you, you kind of would have different priority dates for when those provisionals were filed. Um, but again, in this situation, it might be a, a good compromise rather than putting it all into the first one and uh, the associated expense. And you can see here, you can file six 
uh, provisional applications for the price of one non-provisional uh, with regard to the USPTO filing fees um, for, for a large company. So the savings can, can be great there. Okay, strategy number three, um, what I call the omnibus application. And this is sort of like omnibus legislation where they throw a bunch of stuff in there. Similar idea, the idea is instead of filing multiple different applications that are on the related invention, just put it all into one application. It might be a long application, um, but what that allows you to do is one of these two strategies, You're either the serial filings, which are shown on the left of the slide, or the parallel filings. So looking at the serial filings, you might file the omnibus this year, and then in 2021, next year, uh, you can file a continuation from that omnibus application. And then in 2022, perhaps budgets increase more, or you can spread out your expense, then you can file a second continuation that claims priority from that first continuation, similar to how we saw on the uh, continuation um, uh, foundational concept slide. And then on the right side, the parallel filings, the idea is you file uh, multiple continuations at the same time from that original omnibus application. So you might file the omnibus application this year, and then next year, let's say you have the budget to file all three applications on all three of the inventions that are included in there. Now, the omnibus here would be a non-provisional application. Um, you could also put in uh, omnibus as a provisional application and use one of the previous strategies. And that's another point, the strategies here can be combined in, in many different ways. Strategy number four takes advantage of the international PCT application. And so I've called it the PCT holding pattern. And this would apply to the PCT application as your first filing. So taking a step back, the PCT stands for the Patent Cooperation Treaty. So it's an international treaty. Most of the developed countries, but not all, are party to it. And what it is is a me mechanism to facilitate uh, getting global patent protection or getting patent protection in many countries around the world without having to go right into those countries right away. The PCT is sort of a, a staging ground or, or you know, a place where, as I've called it, you can conduct this sort of holding pattern. And the way that it would work is looking at the timeline here, let's say you could file the PCT in May of 2020, and that would buy you about 30 months before you decide in which countries to file uh, the so-called national stage. And so these are just example countries, US, Europe, Japan, Korea, China, there are other countries that are party to the treaty as well. And so that might buy you some time. Um, and one thing you can do is come back into the United States if you want. You could file the PCT in one of the, I think five or so PCT receiving offices, which are just one of the national patent offices around the world. And then you could say, you know, now I have the budget about 30 months later to then file in the US. So instead of filing a provisional in the US, which then you'd have only 12 months to decide whether to do the non-provisional in the US, by doing this way, you have about 30 months. And the 30 months is approximate because not all countries are 30 months, some are 29, some are 31. And if you miss the foreign filing date, that is a, uh, you're pretty much dead in the water. So it's very important that little squiggly is uh, doing a lot of heavy lifting. So the PCT does cost a little bit more. You're looking at, I think around three or 4,000 to file it but you get a little bit more holding time and you could choose one of the more inexpensive countries to do the search. You can see Russia is relatively cheaper than the United States. And again, the PCT includes most, but not all of the developed countries, uh, Taiwan being one of the um, more notable exceptions that is not part of the PCT. Strategy number five um, is trade secret protection. And as I said, this is broader than just technological inventions. It's generally any commercially valuable um, assets that you've taken reasonable measures to keep secret. You do not go to the government with an application like you do with a patent. You basically do stuff within your company, NDAs, have visitors sign in, keep things in safes, uh, have them password protected, that sort of thing. So that if it's ever stolen, you can then tell the court, look, we did all these things. This is the trade secret. This person wrongfully took it, or as they say, misappropriated it. 
and uh, I should have recourse for that. Now, um, the risk with trade secrets is it does not protect against reverse engineering. So if somebody else takes your product on the market or somehow figures out your method that you're doing and does it without having stolen it from you, they've completely reverse engineered it. There's no protection or recourse with uh, trade secrets, nor is there protection against independent development. So if somebody just comes up with it independently, in contrast to patents, if somebody develops it independently of knowledge of your patent, doesn't matter. Um, the patent still helps in that situation. Trade secrets, it doesn't, it does not help. Okay, so that is part two on securing. And so part three is maintaining. So this is where you have something filed uh, with uh, the patent office or the PCT, and uh, you would like to uh, either reduce or defer the expenses associated with securing that application, keeping those priority dates alive. So strategy number six is delaying the examination of your patent application. And this is through the use of extensions. This might be, um, uh, fairly well known, it's sort of low hanging fruit, but uh, when you're going through those negotiation rounds with the patent office with your application, you can get extensions. Um, they'll typically give you a timeline, maybe three months to respond to something that they put out. And you can say, hey, I need three more months, so six months in total. You have to pay an extension fee. Um, they're increasingly expensive. They start out around $100 or $200, and then they about you know, double or triple from there, um, depending on how many months you need extended. The risk is that you could potentially lose your patent term. So if you're slow in getting back to the patent office, if you're taking extensions and your term might be reduced by that amount of time. So if you took three months, the term might be reduced by three months. And that is a reduction in the 20 year term. So that could be reduced by those months. And further, not all actions that you need to take at the patent office are extendable. And extensions are generally available outside the US as well. So China, Europe, um, <clears throat> you can usually get extensions uh, for um, a nominal fee, at least compared to the cost of a US extension. And finally, um, when you go to the uh, national phase, so as I said, you can file in the PCT and then go into the national phase. You can sometimes defer examination, sometimes up to several years, some countries up to five years. And so you can delay the fees associated with uh, examination in those countries. Strategy number seven is examination in the US and deferral of examination using an RCE. So an RCE is a request for continued examination. Typically those are used when you've got to a final office action, which is usually a second round of negotiation. So you've gone through the first one and then you've come back to the examiner again and then the examiner's still not impressed. And so now they're gonna say, look, if you wanna continue this uh, negotiation, you need to pay a fee and file an RCE. That's how RCEs are, are usually used. Um, but what you can also do for them is suspend action up to three months. So this little graphic is a cut and paste from the actual RCE form. You just check that box and then you fill in the number of months that you want to suspend action up to a maximum of three. Um, again, uh, some of the risks are that these can only be used after a final office action, which I said is usually a, uh, a second office action uh, in a single examination. And the fees are kind of high. For the first one, it's 650 or 1300, depending on whether you're a, a small company or a large one. And um, uh, for a second RCE, it's, it's, I think, at least double that. Okay, the next few strategies relate to claim drafting techniques. So as I mentioned, the claims are what define the scope of your protection with a patent application. They are the numbered paragraphs or sentences at the end of the patent document. And uh, that is what is actually infringed. When you infringe a patent, what you're doing is infringing one of those or more of those claims, uh, one, of the, one or more of those numbered paragraphs at the end of the document. And so these strategies are related to drafting those claims or amending them during examination to get you to allowance so that you can avoid this repeated round of negotiation. Now, um, the risk here is that you get a smaller scope of protection because you're, you're narrowing the claims, but it might be a suitable compromise. 
So the first technique relates to um, narrowing the claims by focusing on many of the features of your device. So I'm just using this device here, which was uh, from an actual former client. This was uh, a heart valve annuloplasty device. So this is delivered through the femoral artery into the heart and it uh, expands and then it anchors onto the um, this one was for the mitral valve annulus, and then it contracts to um, control the, the oversized opening of the valve annulus, which can cause regurgitation, backflow of blood, and, and reduce cardiac output. So um, none of that's important. Let's just look at this device. So this mechanical device, you might claim all these different aspects that are circled in red. And um, the point there is that the examiner would then need to find something in the prior art that has all of these things in it or multiple references that can be combined to show all of these things. And so the more things you have, the more things they need to find, the higher chance you have of, uh, of not finding those things and of getting a patent. <clears throat> now, like I said, the risk there is it's a narrower protection. And so an infringer or a, an accused infringer could just say, okay, I'll make it with you know, three of those features, but not the fourth one. And now they've evaded uh, potentially uh, infringement. Um, but what this allows you to do is to potentially file, um, uh, get a patent, excuse me, get a patent. And then before it goes on to issue, because the, they're going to tell you, hey, this has been allowed. And then like we saw on the previous slide with continuation practice, you can then file a continuation. And then we'll see another strategy later where you can delay uh, the examination of that continuation, so you can actually buy time. Another strategy related to claim drafting is to go narrow on a very valuable feature. So the previous one was include many features. This one is go very in-depth, detailed on one feature and uh, a feature of value, what I've called the smallest stealable unit, which is a uh, uh, stolen uh, from um, the uh, damages theory, a uh, smallest saleable unit. Uh, so I call it the smallest stealable unit. And this is basically you asking yourself, what must be copied to practice this invention? And if it's something that must be copied, then uh, it's provide a lot more value as opposed to maybe the previous strategy where not all of those features need to be copied, but this one does. And so again, it can provide value, but then it's very narrow. So the examiner may be more likely to allow it. And um, that's the idea behind this strategy. And finally, the claim uh, drafting strategy number 10 relates to a picture claim. And so this is where you just claim the whole kitchen sink. And maybe you don't uh, claim all the features in as much detail as the previous strategy, but you list all the features. So this can be thought of as maybe uh, an expansion of, uh, I believe it was strategy number eight, where there were only four or five features, and now we've got all the features in there. And so that's very likely um, to be uh, much, more, much more likely to be allowable. Um, there's also a lower risk of invalidity because then somebody challenging it later would be hard pressed to find something exactly with what you've got because you've got all these features claimed. However, as with um, the other um, prior strategy listing a lot of the features, there's the risk of a design around because then they just have to leave one of those features out and they may have uh, found a way to design around your patent. But again, in the time of COVID, maybe this strategy uh, makes sense, especially when we consider it in conjunction with this strategy. So this strategy is a placeholder continuation. And what that means is uh, you file a continuation application like we saw before. So you have a pending continuation, you have a pending application and then you file a continuation. But what makes it a placeholder is you don't pay fees and you can do that initially. Now the patent office eventually will want their money. And so what that means is they're gonna send you a notice and say, hey, you didn't pay us and you need to pay us by this date. And typically it's two months after that notice comes, but you can extend that up to uh, about seven months after that notice comes. So you're looking at at least seven months after you file the application. Um, there will be some time to get that notice as well. So it might be maybe eight, eight and a half, nine months after you file the continuation application. Uh, when you have to actually pay the fees. And so it can buy you some time. You can use one of those claim drafting techniques, get your allowance, file this placeholder continuation, and um, you know, uh, hopefully uh, budgets have increased by that time. And then so this chart here is uh, sort of an excerpt from the earlier continuation practice chart that we saw. Um, so just looking at the chart on the right here, we had the pending application, 
um, let's say in this example, we didn't do the claim drafting technique. We just want to let that one go abandoned. We can file a continuation application uh, and, and then go from there. Now, the big uh, risk caveat to take away here is it needs to be, the continuation application needs to be filed prior to the abandonment of the prior application. And that prior application needs to be in good standing. So there's no um, outstanding extension fees that are due. So if you try and do this within the extension period of the prior application, you're gonna need to pay those extension fees first. As I said, these strategies, I'm going over them at a very high level. If any look of interest, you should talk to uh, uh, preferably an IP attorney to uh, see if they might be right for you. Strategy number 12, what I've called the consolidation CIP. And this one, especially you'll want to talk to uh, somebody who knows what they're doing with IP. So the idea here is looking at the chart, you've got three applications. Let's say they're just pending in 2019. They weren't necessarily filed then. Maybe they were, but um, you know, um, when you get to the time of COVID, now you're saying, oh no, I've got three applications pending. How do I support the expense associated with uh, examination of all of them? What you could consider doing is consolidating them into a CIP. And a CIP is a continuation in part. And what that means is it's similar to the continuation we saw, but you've added material to it. So you've added either written description and or uh, figures. And so that's why it's a in part. It's got some of it, but then it's got some more. And then you can have them all combined into one. And then perhaps when um, the budgets increase in 2021 in this example, you can then break them out and file continuations, uh, uh, perhaps as you, as you had them before in 2019. Another way of doing this is doing it in serial. So this is the same strategy, but just done in serial. So you have the three pending applications in 2019, consolidate them in 2020 into the CIP, and then you can do continuations in serial. So continuation number one, perhaps you file that in 2021, and then you wait until 2022 to file continuation number two, and then number three in 2023. Now, those two strategies, uh, you can see there's a lot of risk bullets <laughs> on this slide. And um, again, you should talk to somebody if this is of interest. I'll just mention a couple of the biggies here. To do a CIP, you have to have a substantial portion of the parent application. Uh, furthermore, you need to have at least one common inventor. So you can't just take all these different inventions that you have filed on and stuff them together. You need to have at least one common inventor, so they need to be related in some way at least. And um, you're gonna need a substantial portion of each. And so um, that may not be right for all of your applications, but maybe it is for some of them. Um, the um, uh, other issues that could come into play here is priority date. As I said, the priority date you get when you put those details down. And now you've got these three pending applications. Maybe they were filed at different times. They had clear priority dates, but now you've put them all into one. And so there could be a question later <clears throat> as to what is the priority date with, with the claims in, in that combined application. Okay, strategy number 14. So this is the PCT holding pattern, but now we're looking at it from the perspective of I've got an application pending already. We saw it before in the maintain in the securing IP section where we were filing the PCT as the first application. Now we've got an application pending. How can I make use of the PCT? So in this example, let's say we filed a provisional, a US provisional application in May of 2019. And so within 12 months, we can then file the PCT. And the PCT can only go back 12 months. And that's why it's at 12 months there. Um, that's the maximum. You could file it before the 12 months, but you can't claim priority back uh, more than 12 months. So if it's been more than 12 months from the provisional, then you can no longer file the PCT. Uh, and so what then that does is then give you about 18 months to decide whether to file in the U.S. as a non-provisional or to file in other countries as um, what would be the equivalent of a non-provisional. So applications that would be examined in other countries. And again, it's about 18 months because some countries are, you know, it would be 17, some would be 19, that kind of thing. 
Strategy number 15. So this is uh, going from the PCT into the US. And what you can do is you can um, defer some of the filing fees associated with that. So when you um, file that national phase, so you're in the PCT already, and then you're going into the US, there are several different fees that are due, um, a national stage fee, things like an examination, search fee, that kind of thing. The only one that's actually due when you file is the national stage fee, and then you can defer those other fees. So that's similar to the um, placeholder strategy where you don't pay any fees. Um, but in this case, you have to pay one of the fees, but you can defer the others. Another option, so the second bullet now, is to do a uh, bypass continuation, but to do it similar to that placeholder strategy I talked about. And so what that means is basically you're filing, instead of a national phase, it's categorized as a bypass continuation. And since it's categorized as a continuation, then you can um, not pay the filing fees when you file and you'll have that approximately seven to nine months or so to then pay the filing fees. And the fees will be due later, um, uh, typically about a few months, at least a few months after filing. And the last strategy is, let's say you have patents that have been issued already and uh, you want to know, you know, is there anything I can do with those fees? There's some wiggle room. In fact, the, the wiggle room is as wide as this 12 month window. So you got 12 months of wiggle room, I guess. Um, <clears throat> the patent office calls this a, a freebie window where the six months before the actual due date, if you pay within that six month window, then there's no surcharge that's, that's owed. Um, so you could, you know, potentially wait until the end of that first six month window to avoid the surcharge, but not have to pay right away. So in that way, you could defer that expense or you can defer up to um, six months after the actual due date uh, with the payment of the surcharge. Um, I, I forget what the surcharge is. I want to say it's a, a few hundred dollars. And so that's that's where you have an issued patent. And so those are the, the strategies. Uh, hopefully that wasn't too quick. As I said, this was very high level. And if you're interested in any of these, I highly recommend you consult with counsel um, and a couple of the obligatory disclaimers. This is not establishing an attorney-client relationship, and this is not particularized advice um, for, for anybody. So um, with that, uh, I thank you very much. And I think we may have time for some questions. Great, thank you, Tom, for um, sharing all of those strategies um, with us today. Um, if you have any questions, please go ahead and, and um, put them in either the chat or the Q&A. We'll make sure we get to them um, ASAP. Um, the first one coming through is, how can I save money on patentability searches? Um, you know, you, I mean, foreign searchers, you know, or for Go search, what's your, um, you know, insight on that? Yeah, so searching is very common, and that's typically done to look into whether this is an invention worth filing on, because filing costs more. And so a search, you know, you're looking at um, something around a thousand, maybe a couple thousand, depending on what it is and how in depth you would like it to be searched. Um, one way to do that, I mean, is first, you can do it yourself, honestly, um, you can try it and just you know, search uh, Google patents, search the, the uh, scientific journals uh, for articles and that kind of thing. Sometimes just getting on Google, you have an idea, is it out there? Oh, it is, okay. Um, now, there are companies that do it professionally and the reason they do it is because they can do it better than, uh, you know, a typical person at home Googling things. And so if we have something that's very important to a company, we'll often hire them. And so if you're going to go that route, um, one possibility is that uh, there are some searchers in foreign countries, for example, India, that uh, can provide much lower um, search costs, you know, something in, in the, on the order of a few hundred dollars as opposed to maybe a thousand dollars. There are certain, there might be some risks if you do, you know, like I do some aerospace clients, I can't uh, go outside the United States, there's export controls and that kind of thing. Um, but if it's, you know, medical devices, life science type issues, um, and, and you don't have any concerns about sending it outside, um, you know, that, that might be a, a cheaper option, uh, cheaper route to go with, with searches. 
And there are different types of searches too. That's generally for a, a patentability search where you want to find out is what I have patentable versus uh, an invalidity search, which is um, uh, am, I, am I going to be uh, infringing anyone's uh, patents with, with what I want to do. Great. Um, we have another one coming in. Um, what is the estimated cost to hire an attorney for a utility patent? So this will vary depending on where you go. If you go to a smaller boutique, um, I think, you know, it's going to be typically billed by the hour. You're looking at anywhere from 100 to 300 an hour. The total cost will typically, I think, come out. Mm, I don't, I mean, it's highly dependent. I'm, I'm going to say in around the 5,000 maybe to seven or $8,000 range for a smaller boutique firm. If you go with a larger firm, um, certainly a firm like ours where we we try and uh, cater to you know high value uh, um, patents and clients it's going to be something on the higher range maybe eight to fifteen thousand um, dollars and a, a note i should say is that as i mentioned one way of thinking about patents is on the spectrum of confidence and so we can typically, uh, our firm and many firms will will um, tailor their work to your budget. And so if you say, look, this is my budget, you know, what can you get done? Then there are certain things you can do. One is like, you know, coaching the application. So if you have it coached, you're going to look at something much cheaper. Um, you know, I just had a solo inventor, a uh, very smart guy, used to be at NASA, <clears throat> and he had an idea. And he, you know, I think that was like a $2,500 application. It's like, this is what I got. What can you do? And so we used actual uh, coaching technique that I, uh, that I, that I put in here. So, so I actually use these strategies, uh, some of them. And um, so that's something you can do as well. But, but that should give you, you know, I think um, probably 15, I think 20 is probably the highest on a very complex, very important invention. Um, pharmaceutical might be different. I'm talking mostly from my experience in the medical device and the uh, aerospace and mechanical type inventions. Great. Now, how can I save money in deciding which of my company's inventions to file a patent application on? Yeah, so um, that's that gets to the, the strategy. And um, this is going to really depend on, you know, what is it that uh, uh, or what's the reason you're, you're interested in patents? What's what, what's the value for, for the company? And, and then um, once you've identified that, then I think you want to look at your, um, uh, your um, patents that you're interested in filing or ones that you already have filing and see which ones serve that goal the best. And if you have a budget, you know, typically um, the in-house IP council would be told, you know, look, you need to reduce 20% or whatever it is, or this is your budget. And so you have that as, as one fixed constraint. <clears throat> and then you've got, you know, you've identified what the reason is for your patents. And then you've sort of ranked them like these, these, these are the top ones. Um, sometimes they're considered like core technology, like things you must have. Other things are like, you know, nice to have, but not, not that important. And other ones might be, maybe these are like blocking patents we filed just to help us out in the competitive uh, marketplace. And so having that hierarchy, I think, along with the constraint of what your budget is, can help you out. Now, how you actually identify what your goals are, that's dependent on the company and what they want to do. Um, and then another um, strategy uh, for that issue is what some people call pruning. So let's say you have applications already filed, or maybe you have patents that are already issued, and you want to decide which one should I keep. And um, there's kind of a similar process involved in that as well. What are we even doing with patents in the first place? And then kind of hierarchically ranking, you know, what are these issued patents doing for us? What are these filed applications? Are these the core technology? Are these things that are nice to have? Are these just, you know, uh, perhaps blocking patents, that kind of thing. Um, and on the issued patent side, the, the maintenance fees can get very expensive. Um, the maintenance fees are due at uh, three and a half, seven and a half, and eleven and a half years after the patent issues. And each one of those um, <clears throat> time intervals, at each one of those, the, the price goes up um, quite dramatically. And so, if you if you cut off uh, just a few issued patents, it uh, could save a lot. Um, and you can't get it back. And that's that's the thing I understand. You're not going to be able to get it back, but it could save you um, some uh, some serious cash. Um. 
Fantastic. Um, I think we have one more. What are things to keep in mind when performing prior art search, both to make sure you do it well and to save money and time during this process? Prior art search. Um, so I think one important thing is to make sure you describe your invention clearly. You want the searchers to understand the invention so they know what to look for. Um, nothing worse than getting back search results and looking at them and just they're completely irrelevant, um, which could mean that there's nothing out there. Like you've come up with the steam engine and you're the next, you know, um, I don't know, who was that, Watt? Uh, or um, it could mean that the invention was not clearly understood and the results are just clearly irrelevant. Um, I've only had that happen, I think, once. Um, that was way back, though. I'm much better now. Uh, so I think clearly identif clearly explaining what, what the technology is to the searcher is important. Um, and honestly, that can be an issue sometimes with the foreign searchers. So um, we've used Indian searchers, many Indian search companies are coming up and, and sometimes language barrier is just, it's an actual thing. Um, so it's something to think about. Um, so that's, that's one issue. And then the other thing is to keep in mind, what do you want to search? So you can search US patents and applications, you can search outside US of European, you can look at um, international PCT applications, you can search journal articles. Uh, typically US patent examination uh, examiners will cite other US or, or other patent documents, US or outside US. Sometimes you'll get journal articles. I think that's more common um, in some of the life sciences where there's a lot of uh, R&D and and uh, investigation being done in universities. But um, th so that's something else to keep in mind. What is it you wanna search? And so if you limit that scope, that will also keep the cost down because now they're only having to search one database versus, uh, versus many others.